Life happens, and not always the way we expect it to. Every single day, we face change, stress, and uncertainty. What if you could learn to thrive no matter what life throws your way? Resilience expert Adam Markell and his inspiring guests explore breakthrough strategies to fully embrace change and build the resilience required to become change-proof. Hey everybody, it's Adam Markell, and welcome back to another Change Proof podcast. I've got a I've got a wonderful conversation ahead with a, a gentleman. I'm going to introduce here in a second, but you're, you're going to want to make a moment to sit to listen to this, and you know, think about it hard. Think about it. Think about it easy. <laughs> think about it in a holistic way. Uh, and it may be an episode that you're going to want to share with some people that you know who may be dealing with some of the same stuff. So I've got a guest today. His name is Tom Campbell, uh, Sergeant Major Tom Campbell. After suffering from survivor guilt, TBI, PTSD, and a plethora of other issues all at the same time, Tom went into a very dark place and attempted to take his life. A friend who would later become his wife intervened at the last minute and saved him from himself. Today, Tom speaks about these experiences publicly as even started doing stand-up comedy. <laughs> it's a way to get the word out, uh, to help people through humor and through his story. It is a profound conversation ahead, so sit back and enjoy my discussion today with Tom Campbell. All right, Tom. So your introduction, your bio, you know, it, it says some part, of course, of your history and your experience. And, and that's what those things are for. That's when I hear my own bio read. It's sort of like, you know, encapsulating <laughs> some chunk right. of my life. You know, it's <laughs> kind of an interesting, funny thing. Um, but my question to you at the outset of this conversation is, what is one thing that is not part of your introduction, your bio, uh, so to speak, that you would love for people to know about you? One thing that's not in there, that's not written and in, in, in all that. What's one thing you'd love for people to know about you at the start of our conversation? Uh, what, yeah, so the, the bio focuses a lot on my military career. And, uh, and now that I'm retired, I'm finding out there's more to life than, than Army. But I think the one thing that's not really covered in there is that I'm a... Life is a great place, and it took me a while to find that out, unfortunately. And I do stand-up comedy, and that's and the reason I do that stand-up comedy is I strive to make not just my place better, but everybody around me place better. And that's where the comedy drove in, is if I can make you laugh for 10 seconds, you could have the crappiest day of your life, but that's 10 seconds I took you out of that crap and put you in somewhere good. And stand-up comedy is uh i mean i guess for somebody that came out of the a career in the military and and the kind of things that you are trained to face and i don't, i don't know actually how much of that you 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 were you know put in the middle of i know we train for for the worst often in we don't always experience those things but did you see combat were you in in harm's it, way yeah quite a few times i mean and in reality i cheated death quite a few times during there uh, so I, I was a paratrooper, an infantry paratrooper in the army, and uh, and I grew up as a sniper. And uh, so we didn't start deploying though until I was uh, I was a platoon sergeant, and immediately after I was a first sergeant. So I wasn't a young guy when we started deploying. I'd already been in the army for a, a good spell, but. I ended up uh, one trip to Iraq and four trips to Afghanistan, almost back to back. So basically, that's five plus years I spent in combat. Deployed for five five years. In a right. Collectively, not all at one time, of course. Sure. But I've been gone a year, come back a year, gone a year. So this this <laughs> this is a question, boy. I didn't expect to ask it, but it's coming to me. So I'm, I'm going to fire away. Yeah, nothing's off the table. Wait, exactly. Looking back now, what was scarier? The first time you jumped out of a plane or the first time you stood up in front of an audience to be a comic? I would probably say first time I actually tried to do comedy uh, because the airplane part, everything happens so fast. You don't have enough time to get scared. <laughs> I mean, but trying to get up in front of a room full of strangers and, and then try to captivate their attention and then hold their attention. It was kind of intimidating when I first started this. 
are there parallels between those two things? Again, I we're following even before we hit the record. Yeah. One of the things Tom and I said <laughs> yeah. was we're going to follow the breadcrumbs wherever they lead us. So <laughs> there's not a lot of parallels, but I would say, I mean, outside of jumping out of a perfectly good aircraft uh, in flight, uh, where some people just died is kind of idiocracy by itself. Uh, but in just my military career as a, in whole, though, that did feed into the comedy and it go and kind of back to trying to turn, uh, make a lemon laid out of lemons is, uh, but I will tell you, 32 years of being in the army, I saw some funny stuff. I imagine so. <laughs> I mean, uh, I remember growing up watching and, and I think I'm maybe a, a minute or two older than you, but the show that, that I remember as a kid, I think it was on Tuesday nights was MASH. You, you remember right. MASH, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And obviously that 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 was a, a sitcom, com, right. you know, comedy show of sorts, situational comedy about life in the army in Korea in the 50s. Right. And, and obviously in the middle of any war, pick a war, it doesn't matter what, or a conflict or whatever you want to call it, where people's lives are, are threatened, where people die, where people are being killed. Right. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot that you could say is funny. And yet- that show ran for a really long time based on a book and all that. And, and there are funny right. things that occur even in the midst of that absurdity uh, and even of that tragedy. Yeah. So you well, have, you it, have a lot it, to it, draw it, on. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's kind of sometimes ironic. And uh, uh, you'd asked earlier if I'd wrote a book and I said I hadn't. So there was a book that was written about me. It's written in French, though. It's called OP3 Road by Hubert Picard. So I can't read it to you because I don't speak French. But uh, Hubert Picard's a phenomenal guy. We've been friends ever since he wrote he uh, wrote that book. We've been friends. But he had got embedded in my company in Iraq the day that a very traumatic event had happened to the company. But he wrote about that in particular is one thing that captivated that that just really captivated him was in the, as, as stressful as the environment was and especially that at that time I mean, we were I mean, we were averaging five to seven firefights a day seven days a week in a little town called karma up in the fallujah uh, province and even in that though whenever the guys would get together you, they would do the funniest stuff, one, just to make laughter. And everybody says laughter is the best medicine. It is. Even after losing, I mean, of course, whenever we lose a soldier, I mean, it, it, I mean, we're a family, so it hurts the family. But then somebody would do something completely off the wall to break the mood, get our minds off of it, and then we'd go back to work. I'm curious if there's a mindset that, you know, when, when I was asking earlier just about what if there's a parallel between the comedy and 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 I'll say and the combat maybe we can keep it to two C words right yeah right because well, <laughs> I only imagine I'm a public speaker myself and I I stand in front of audiences uh, all the time and have for more than twelve years and and I remember the first time I I got up in front of a large group of people and of course they didn't have they didn't have guns and they weren't pointing at me but right. they had their but they had their eyes which can feel like, right. you know, when somebody's looking at you, <laughs> feel like they've got an assault weapon right there. Right. And their arms, you know, arms are crossed and they're looking at you like, <laughs> who in the world is this person? Right. You know, right, that's right. kind of a hostile audience right there. But is there something you can say about maybe the, the, the comparison of the mindset for combat and the mindset for, for being a, a stand-up comedian? So, yeah, and, and this is might sound a little bit strange, but part of um, when you're in war, especially when you're when you're in direct contact with the enemy, there's, I mean, even, there, there's a level of a psyops that is always going on. I mean, you've got to try to get in the enemy's head and try to get the enemy to do what you want the enemy to do. Of course, that doesn't always happen, probably seldom happens, but the uh, th the same goes with when you're in front of an audience is you've got to read the audience, you've got to, and then you got to try to plan your set out. Um, you got to try to estimate what the audience is going to be. And a uh, Friday night crowd is going to be different from a Saturday night crowd. And and the first show is going to be different from the late night show. And, and so you got to tailor your sets accordingly and even public speaking i mean when i go out and tell my story i gotta figure out I me mean, 
is it a group of veterans? Is it a, an active duty unit that I'm talking to? Is it a school? Is it, I mean, it's all different audiences. So I come in with a game plan, but then in the middle of executing that plan, the audience has a vote <laughs> in how that how the outcome comes. And then you've got to try to adapt your speaking or, or comedy set with what the audience actually gives you uh, as you read them. So I'd say that's probably the biggest parallel between yeah. the two is uh, you can't just take for face value. You've got to, you got to come in with a plan, but then you've got to be able to tweak that plan in flight. I'm holding up a book. I, I'm fortunate to have been a part of a couple of years ago, this book pivot. And that's this concept, this agility, adaptability, however you want to call it, this flexibility on the one hand and, and the capacity to read the situation, to read the room in, in, in what we're talking right. about and, and then be able to adjust on the fly. And I would imagine it's the same out in the field um, when, when there's a, is. a plan of war, a plan, you know, strategy, and, and you've got to read what's happening that, that maybe changes that plan pretty dramatically, I would imagine. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, a, a great plan is only good to the moment of execution. And no. then it turns into a good plan. I want you to repeat that, please. I said a, a great plan is only good to the point of execution. Now, Tom, I'm, I'm going to ask you, is that is that somebody's quote that you remember? Is that your quote? No. So I'd heard that somewhere years ago, and I cannot remember where I heard that. at. And it was one of my leaders had said it, and I cannot remember who it was that said that. But, I love it. But I'm once writing, you, writing it once down you <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Once at the point of execution, though, everything's out the window. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that Churchill said some things like that. I mean, we know Mike Tyson, <laughs> in a very different context, said something similar <laughs> right. to that, right? Everybody's everybody's uh, courageous or something until they get hit. Once they get hit in the nose, you know, yeah, right. their plan is completely <laughs> out the window. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched or the bullets right. fly or what have you. But, you know, and we, we've all heard similar kind of things. I haven't heard it quite that way before. That's why I wrote that down. But that capacity, that mindset that is not so so stuck, so fixed, if you will, uh, the, the, the fluid mindset, right. the, you know, the mindset that can, can pivot, I think is so vitally important in life. Now, I often talk to business audiences, so I'm, yeah. I'm putting things in a business context, but it doesn't matter what the context, whether it's that, whether it's comedy, whether it's public speaking, whether it's military situations. So I, I think I want to get into your story and I want to keep in mind this, or at least put out there this thread, the mindset and whether we have a fixed mindset or an open mindset, where on earth does that fit in the place sometimes that we find ourselves where we are in pain? mentally where we are in feel as though we don't have options where we don't where we lose hope where we feel as though there's not not a lot we can do to change our situation so if you could share a little bit about your story and and lead into a bit of the the yeah. things you talk about today the work that you're doing that that would be great tom and thank you and thank you for your service yeah you're extended i appreciate it so i guess that i get started but we had in those five deployments that I, I talked about, two of them were very volatile uh, deployments, or, or more so all of them were, but these two that was very significant. And one was uh, while we were in Iraq, my I was, uh, even though I was a first sergeant, only the first sergeant wouldn't be the company sniper, but it was a really unique situation. I was a senior sniper in the brigade, and I was ended up I was a company sniper. Every time the guys were out, I was in a hide site, and then my spotter, was also the company medic, Sergeant Brian Baum. And uh, hands down, the best spotter I'd ever had over the years. And But we were always together. And they had brought in three Syrian snipers to kill me. And and one of, two of them were just marksmen. They weren't really good snipers and they, they met their fate fairly quick. Uh, one, no, Louie was good. And I had hunted that guy down. He had shot a few of my guys, didn't kill them, but wounded them and uh, ended up, long story short, Louie got to, uh, I was out on a hasty patrol. Louie got the drop on us and, and killed Sergeant Vaughn. And that really irritated me. Lot. One, not only just because that uh, he was the closest soldier to me, not that he was any more or less important than any of the other ones, but the other part was that Louie had, had got the best of me. 
And so I ended up went on a 10 day manhunt trying to find him and ended up, we ended up getting him. But the things that bothered me with Sergeant Bond's death, and this is, this is what I would find out later, survivor guilt, one of many survivor guilt issues that I was dealing with, but he was going on leave that night because he, they were waiting for him to get back to Alaska to induce labor to his wife for their first child. My children were old enough to have lifelong memories of their dad, uh, where Leia, his daughter, would never know her dad. And I was at a point in my career, I had met all the goals I wanted to in my career, and where Sergeant Baum had a lot of goals he hadn't met yet. Definitely was a future sergeant major. One, hands down, one of the most professional non-commissioned officers I'd ever worked with in the Army. And I was at a point in my life, I could have died happy, and he still had a lot of life left in him. And that patrol, he wasn't supposed to be out there. He, let, he talked me into letting him go at the last minute. It was a hasty patrol that I had spun up uh, as a reaction to enemy fire that, or harassing fire. And so that I, I lived with that for many years. And then you fast forward a little bit, uh, a few deployments later, and I had some head injuries. Uh, that never got looked at. We didn't know a lot about head injuries at the time. And, uh, but I ended up got selected to be, a, well, I was in Afghanistan, got selected to be a Sergeant Major. And I, when I redeployed, I had two weeks to get from Alaska to Fort Bliss, Texas. And when I redeployed, I find out that a 20 year marriage had went down the drink while I was gone. And I don't have enough time to process it because I only have two weeks to get to, from uh, Anchorage, Alaska down to Fort Bliss, Texas. And so when I get down to Fort Bliss, though, I'm in my little travel trailer that I towed down there and I'm by myself. And it's the first time ever I'd been, I mean, or a very long time I've been by myself. I wasn't in charge of nobody. Nobody's in charge of me. It was just me and my little trailer and my motorcycle and my truck. And that was, that was it to the Tom Campbell clan. And the old saying that an idle mind is the devil's playground, oh, by God, it is. And I have nothing to do but think about all the survivor guilt that I had, about decisions that I'd made that cost people's lives. I thought about the family that I didn't have, that I used to have, that I don't have anymore. And at the time, I had a strange relationship with my kids. Great relationship with them now, but at the time, I had a strange relationship. And, and then on top of that, I was having these migraine headaches. I didn't know what was causing them, but my head would hurt so bad I couldn't move. And then I started self-medicating. I started drinking my, and I'd get, feel the headache come on. Uh, me and Jim Beam would start having a doctor session, which I would find out Jim Beam is not a good doctor, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> but I would drink myself to sleep every night. And then I would hear stories from other uh, students that was staying in the campground where of riding wheelies out of the trailer park in the middle of the night on my motorcycle and had no recollection of even riding a stupid motorcycle. So I started doing stupid stuff and not knowing about it. And what I tell people is I had gotten to the point that I didn't care. I didn't care if I lived or died. I was very angry. I hated myself. I hated God. I hated everybody around me. And if you meet anybody that graduated from class 61 and Sergeant Major Academy and ask them if they know Tom Campbell, they'll say, oh yeah, I know that idiot. And they won't have nothing good to say about me, unfortunately. And so I was suicidal before I knew I was suicidal. And what I mean by that was because I didn't care if I lived or died, I did stupid stuff like ride my motorcycle at 100 plus miles an hour in, in uh, gridlock traffic on I-10 I that turns into parking lot I-10 in the afternoons because I didn't care for my health and I didn't care for your health or anybody else's health around me. And I, I like rock, I still like rock climbing, but I would go out to Waco tanks and I would climb just to get away from the world. And I would climb a couple hundred feet up in the air with no anchors and no ropes because I didn't care if I fell or not because I didn't care if I lived or died. So I was suicidal before I knew I was suicidal. But what broke the camel's back was I had an episode in class and then I was forced to go to mental health. And when I went to mental health, I had a chip on my shoulder because now I got to prove I don't have PTSD. And the poor little old lady that I saw in there, I made such a spectacle out of myself that she refused to be in the same room with me because she feared for her health. And so then I went and see the commandant and I thought I was going to get kicked out of the, of the Sergeant Major Academy. And instead, though, he had my enlisted records brief, which shows everything, all your awards and deployments and assignments and everything that you've done in your career. And he, he asked me a question. He said, out of all these deployments, how many NCOs or non-commissioned officers did you force to get help? 
and that rung a bell because I'd always preach to my leaders to lead by example. If you can't, if you can't live by your own preaching, I don't want you on the team. And in fact, if you got to tell me how good a leader you are, I don't want you on the team. If your actions show me how good a leader you are, I do want you on the team. And so that rung a bell because I had forced people to get help. And some of those are alive today because I forced them to get help. But somehow I was above getting help. So I'm going to try to live my own preaching. So I'm going to give this mental health an honest effort. And I go back to uh, to mental health. And my next psychologist, of course, he's a big guy. He's about that much taller than me, about that wide, had hands big enough, looked like he had bananas for fingers. And uh, I had a few sessions with him. He was leaving. They gave me to it. And then they sent me to another little old lady, bless her heart, Miss Pierce. And she picked up on this thing called TBI, traumatic brain injury. And asked if I'd ever been screened. Well, no, why would I? I mean, I've done, I don't have any holes in my head and I don't I haven't lost any marbles. So I don't. So I go off to, she sends me over to the TBI clinic on Fort Bliss and they do the MRIs and CAT scans and muscle memory test, uh, muscle motor or skill tests, and memory tests. And, and, and so they say, look, your front left lobe of your brain is bruised, which explains a few months before I redeployed in Afghanistan, I fell off a cliff and a rock and smashed me on the head. And uh, luckily, I had my helmet on, but it knocked me unconscious. And so I mean, it, that was explained. And the doc said that the bruise will heal itself over time. He said, but you got something else going on in there. On your on that same low, about the size of a 50 cent piece of dead tissue, where you had an, you evidently had an aneurysm during one of your brain injuries. And that will never heal. So we'll get you better than you are now. But like Toby Key sings, you, you, won't, be, you, uh, you won't be as good as you once was. And uh, But that's actually what broke the camel's back was now on top of the failed marriage, the relationship, uh, the survivor guilt, uh, questioning my decisions and everything else is now my brain's not right. And so in my mind, I, did, I could not fathom how would they promote me to Sergeant Major? How would they and keep me in the Army? And I, have, I mean, I know nothing but the Army. I don't know what I'm going to do outside. But that's actually what broke the camel's back was there was one common denominator in all my problems, and it was me. And in my mind, if I removed that common denominator, everybody around me's world would be better. So that's when I started making a plan to end everything. And I, but I can't, I don't want to hang myself or shoot myself or because for a couple of reasons. One, I didn't want to jeopardize my kids getting the benefits from my survival benefit or survivor benefits and life insurance. And I didn't want to just be a statistic. I wanted to, I wanted to stage an accident and I found the perfect place to stage an accident on Trans Mountain Road uh, there in El Paso, which goes up in the mountains. And it's, and I had the perfect place, a little, a sharp left curve coming down the hill there's a rock wall right there and then that curve and it looks like i can make me look like i just missed it with my motorcycle and hit that rock wall and that'd be the end of it and but i can't execute it because i got to get my affairs in order for my kids and uh so there, while i'm getting my affairs in order i rehearsed that plan i can't tell you how many times i go to the top of the mountain i'd race that motorcycle down and i would slow down before i got to that curve and um uh, and once I got my affairs in order, then it became time for the plan of execution. And so I, I went up the, the mountain and then when I drove by that spot, I looked at that wall and, uh, and I went up to the top, turned the motorcycle around and I'm screaming down. Well, the time it took me to go to the top back down, somebody parked a car uh, between that wall and that curve. And somehow I got that motorcycle. I mean, I was well over 100 miles an hour. I got the motorcycle under control, went around the curve sideways, tire smoking. I don't know how I did not wreck. And I went back up and I pulled over on the side of the road and I waited for that car to leave. And while I'm waiting for that car to leave, my phone rings in my pocket, which I don't answer because I'm on, I'm on a mission here. And I let it go to voicemail and it rings again. I let it go to voicemail and it rings again. And this keeps going on. Finally, I answer the stupid phone and see who this persistent person is. And that persistent person was a little girl that I'd met not too long before. And uh, and we, we were friends. Somehow, she, I mean, as ornery as I was, she couldn't believe I was really as bitter as I put on to be, that there was a good person in there. She kept talking to me, even though I was a bitter butthole. And she had this weird feeling that she just needed to call and check on me. Well, that little old girl, she's my wife now. And I asked her later, I said, how many times, how long would you have called me? 
and their answer was, when you answered the phone, I was getting in my car and I was going to keep calling until either I found you or you answered the phone. She had no idea she was about to intervene in a, in a suicide attempt. But she literally talked me off the mountain that day. So then I start doing and giving the mental health another effort. And uh, they'd given me the TBI clinic. They gave me a bunch of medicine, which I wasn't taking because I didn't want to get hooked on medicines. And I don't, and they'd make me feel loopy and drool on myself. And, and so I never took it, which means it didn't do any good. And uh, so now I'm going to give this an honest ever. I go back to Miss Pierce. She asked about how the medication's doing. I told her I ain't taking it. And so she refused to talk to me. He said, look, if you're not going to get your chemical balances right, it's pointless in me even talking to you. In fact, you can just leave my office now. And I thought, well, I kind of need this lady. I mean, just try to sort through this stuff. So I start taking my stupid medicine. I still take it today. But then I, but it got my chemical balances in right. It made me quit bouncing around. And like if I hadn't, if I didn't take it this morning, I'd be bouncing around like an idiot right now. Another medicine to help my anxiety and to help control my emotions and help me get to sleep. And so I have a, pile of pills I take every night, unfortunately. But once I got my chemical balances right, now we can start trying to sort through and try to build coping mechanisms and what have you to try to deal with the stress. Not that the stresses went away, but I had somebody to help me try to cope and build my mechanisms and what have you. And, um, and so for years, though, I never talked about it, even after I was getting treatment, because I was ashamed of it. And so Teresa, my wife, she actually was the one who really got me to really start talking about it because she kept saying, I mean, look, if you shared your story, how many people or lives can you touch? And in that time, I was still a Sergeant Major, which I found out that there's a lot of mess that we have over the years that we've gained on suicide. And uh, but they promoted me to Sergeant Major. I got to keep my security clearance. I mean, the, all the stuff that everybody says will happen didn't happen if you go get mental health. So I started sharing my story to be able to maybe talk somebody else off the ledge. And I will tell you, that's therapy all in itself. Yes. I mean, every time I share my story, it's like another brick is taken out of the pile on my back. And I mean, it, it gets, it's emotional, especially when I, when I do my, my presentation. I mean, anywhere from an hour and a half or more, depending on how engaged the audience is. But when I'm done, I am emotionally and mentally drained. Because sure. uh, I, I take myself back down memory lane, what have you. Uh, but I would tell you that life is a good place. And I'm in a good place now. I mean, I'm not out of the weeds. I still have my moments. And I still have my days. Bless Teresa's heart. She's She's been my rock. And she stuck with me now where uh, this year will be our 10th uh, year of being married. But that's kind of, that's the abbreviated version <laughs> well, of my story. It, it's, um, you know, it's a, I want to pick up on something you said there at the end about, about the myths in, and I would imagine whether it's military or, or it's otherwise, the feelings are the same. I mean, I, I had something not remotely, uh, well, I, I won't say that I'm, I'm conflicting myself. You know, pain is pain. It doesn't matter what the cause of the pain is. It could be that we, we all have different thresholds for pain. We get that, right? So. Right. So, but the feeling of pain, what pain feels like, I think is the same and mental, the strain of it, the, uh, the feeling of just being out of, out of solutions, out of options, out of, you know, out of a plan that, that, that is not a good place to be. And when there's a solution or, or at least the, uh, the, the promise of a solution that, that, that feels at odds with our ego it's a challenge right because i think a great part of what what we're able to do as human beings has a great deal to do with how we how we see ourselves in the world with with our identity and and your identity well i won't speak for your identity my identity at various points in my life has been as a, a bit of a warrior as a as somebody who could do difficult things maybe be tenacious, be the last person standing, be vigilant, be on, be very good at being on guard for my, for my clients, my family, you know, whatever it might be. Um, And, and when you're, you're in that, when that's the identity, you know, to be vulnerable, to be weak, to be in need of help, to be out of, you know, unable to help yourself. That is a, there's a real conflict there. 
between that re that reality and and your identity in that moment no it, it is and that's one of the reasons that i didn't get help was exactly that i had a persona that i was invincible and a lot of people looked up to me uh i mean and that if whenever we get in stressful situations they always at first on campbell or sergeant major campbell in later deployments was the guy that was never that never got deterred he was the level head and the most stressful. And so all that kind of those reasons was somehow I thought help wasn't me. I don't know if it was because I was ashamed that I wasn't as invincible as everybody thought I was or what, but, but you spark something just a while ago is, you know, the last thing that a person loses before they lose everything is hope. And Napoleon III made two comments. He said, one, if I, if I had enough cloth, I could conquer the world. And he also said, leaders are dealers in hope. And what he means by those two statements is he, his leaders have got to be able to maintain and instill hope in their soldiers to be able to conquer the world. And part of that hope was the cloth is is given just something as minuscule as a piece of cloth for doing something good, which is where the military got the idea of medals and ribbons for their uniform, is you give them a little piece of cloth, which it's not the cloth, it's the recognition of doing good. Now you're embolsting that hope that you as the leader instill. And, and put it in outside of a military's term, is, I mean, leaders aren't just in a, a military or a skill or the boss at the organization. I mean, there's natural born leaders and every out there in the world. But one thing that I think us as humans is we've got to reinstill hope in those that lose hope if we want to save them. Yes, I agree with that. I And that word shame, I, I, I can identify with that as well. Because when I was in a position where I felt like I didn't, I didn't know how could be as that my identity and my reality were were different in that moment of realization than I felt. I felt shame. I felt self-loathing. I felt, yeah, just this uh used the word hate earlier. And and so that is that is a uh I think that's a fairly low watermark for any of us that and I would right. say for all of us because I believe that m most people have felt this at some point and maybe it was fleeting maybe it was passing and and now it's a distant memory and they don't want to they don't want to go back there they don't want they want to think about that right, ever right. again right <laughs> and maybe maybe some people had it over over a period of time a prolonged period of time and maybe some people are dealing with it right now and none right. of us know what the future will hold and and there's a exactly. chance that that we might any of us or all of us feel that way again. But I, I think what, what is really important is the awareness and that you've brought through your story for people that, that may be thinking, you know, somehow again, that, that, uh, that this is, this is a, uh, you know, that there is, that there's some shame in, in acknowledging the need for that kind of help. And I really felt great to hear you say that the military did not penalize you or punish you for being right. for taking steps to get yourself better and to put yourself in a more in in a state of, of equilibrium i mean that chemical chemical things going on in the body you know are well known that the right, right. bodies are almost like a little bit of a science experiment in some levels so you know your food what you drink the things that that uh that we take for supplementation purposes or even the medicines, the right. things that we've got that help us to get to that equilibrium. You know what somebody might call balance, but that 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 state of ho that homeostasis. That's that's required. That's what we have to have. We all have to sleep. We have to have a clear head. We can't be walking around and you know feeling in pain because in those states we cannot make right. We cannot think rightly, and we cannot make right decisions. And certainly. Anybody that that somehow either themselves is, is is questioning whether they should get help, or there are people in their lives, whether they're members of their team, that they can see the signs of burnout that that they are not actively checking in on, checking on, uh, or family members or friends right. they know are struggling that they're not that they're not checking you know checking in on. I think I think this conversation is super helpful in that regard that that we we have to just like 
Teresa, you know, she she had, must have had some instinct, was led somehow yeah. to you to check in on you. And it just turned out, I would say, you know, with divine intervention. That, exactly. That she got you, know, you and she got you. Yeah. Right. And, and that's why I, I share with my story and uh, is a couple of things happened. At the, at the point of execution. One, and actually, this goes back to a good plan, what we talked about with plans earlier. <laughs> I was thinking the same exact thing, Tom. <laughs> same thing. So I think the, had, I mean, why did those people park that car in that place at that time? Who knows? I mean, it could have been uh, just divine intervention or whatever, but that was the disruption to the plan. The intervention happened with Teresa acting on her intuition. And had she not acted on that intuition, was persistent on acting with it, I wouldn't be here. And and to even today, if somebody starts weighing on my mind, I'm gonna pick up the phone and I'm gonna call because you don't know what's on the other end of that phone. And sometimes a simple hello goes a very long way. Uh, but you know, I want to talk real quick. You, know, you, you sparked on something. I had to write me a note down so I don't forget because I definitely want to bring this to light. When we talk about getting me, uh, our mental health and, and health, society as a whole right now, we we look at mental health as a reaction to a crisis, and so nobody goes to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist unless there's a crisis that's happened that forced them to go get help. Very few go on their own cognitive. But why is that? Because like in the military. Every year it's required. We have a physical, uh, our, our physical health examination. We also, every year we get our ears checked, our, no, our eyes checked, and we get our teeth checked every year. Why are we not checking on our cognitive wellness? And, and the, the analogy that I use, so I drag race too. That's how I get my drilling fixed. And drag racing, I've blown up more motors than I can count, unfortunately. And what every, and whenever I make a pass and the motor goes out, when I get back to the shop, I pull that motor out of the car, I take it apart, and I find out what went wrong and how can I prevent that from going wrong again. And then I'll rebuild the motor and put it back in the car and then off to the next weekend race. And But if I don't maintain that motor, I'm not going to get very many races out of it. And I'm going to be right back, pulling it back out, tearing it apart and figuring out what went wrong. And I use that analogy for our mental health. I mean, we, when we reuse it as a reaction to crisis, that's what they're doing. They're pulling out our motor, not really physically, but we're, they're going to help figure out what went wrong and then put everything back together. But if we don't maintain that, we're going to be going right back down there to get rebuilt again. And the Army right now in particular, so now I couldn't, re I couldn't just retire. And so I went back to work for the Army. Uh-huh. And I work for the Army's Holistic Health and Fitness Director. And there's five domains to the Army. And I wish they had this when I was young. I wouldn't hurt so bad now. But there's five domains. Our physical domain, of course, our physical fitness. Our nutritional domain, which, of course, we got to eat right to maintain our fitness. A sleep domain, which is a tremendous amount of sleep science out there that we didn't know about early on. About how, I mean, when I, the Army I grew up in, if you sleep was a crutch and if you fell asleep, you was weak and we were so stupid. But there's two domains that's really hard to, to get across. One is our spiritual domain. Not, it's not religion, but there's something that drives us to do what we do, and how do we optimize that? The other one is our mental wellness domain, and that's where we're trying to drive now. Is quit looking at this as a reaction to a crisis. Let's look at how can we maintain our mental wellness and optimize it, and not just maintain it, but how can we optimize it? for our whole, because our holistic health, if you're, if, and people that say, I mean, yeah, I, I sacrifice my health for my family or my soldiers or whatever. And every time I hear that, I cringe because if you're not right, you can't take care of your loved ones. You've got to be right to be able to. So your mental wellness is just as important as your loved ones, probably more so because you need to be mentally fit to be able to assist others uh, with it. But when you sparked that, that's come up. I just, I just, I had to share it. Tom, I, I'm so happy. I'm so glad you did. Um, and, and it's, it, it's wonderful to know that we're, we're all sort of zoning in or, or uh, where, you know, when you're trying to get your sites to hit something, you've got to adjust right. your sites so that you can you right, know, right. recalibrate, if you will. I think we're all recalibrating it and, in a very similar ways. I've had the 
really great fortune. And I know we're going to wrap up here in a second, but I'll, I'll quickly share this. I, the, the Navy and the Marines have had me come in and it, Fort Pendleton, um, Camp Pendleton, which is yeah, yeah. very near where I, I live uh, half the year and, and, uh, and speak with uh, both, both enlisted uh, men and, and, uh, and officers about what you're talking about, about holistic resilience. We use the term resiliency as a kind of a right. catch-all for that mental, emotional, physical, and even spiritual right. well-being. And, and it's, it's a really big deal to see it as, as not one single thing, like, you know, how physically capable you are, because it's, it's right. such a small piece by itself. I mean, it's, it's an important piece of the puzzle. Right in its entirety but by itself it doesn't it doesn't it won't it won't win the day um no and as you said it's uh there's a lot there that we just don't yet understand about the mind body connection for one thing and and certainly what drives us and the best word to describe what what it is we can't understand about what drives us from the inside out is that's that word spirit or spiritual so right could just couldn't agree more and um i uh I guess what my final question to you is, is really just about, you know, you said life, life is a great place. It's the first thing you said. And I did a Ted talk some years ago where uh, my through line was, was about, I love my life that, that when I went through my period where I was the, the darkest and the darkest for me was having trouble getting asleep at night or trouble getting back to sleep. If I woke up in the middle of the night, trouble waking up in the morning and feeling good at the start of the day. Right. And and I started to do this this very simple and maybe maybe even robotic thing at the start of my days after that period, where I would put my feet on the floor and take a breath and feel some something in the moment I feel grateful for, and then say out loud, I love my life. Right. No matter what. I, I love my life. And I thought when you said, and you said it again just a little bit ago, life is a great place. I thought maybe. Again, you and I have, we have something in common. So is that a mantra? Is that something you say, you remind yourself and remind other people about? It is. I say it a lot. And I've got a really good friend, David Bartley. A lot of people know him by Woody. And and he he does a lot of speaking engagements uh, as well. And me and him have similar stories other than he didn't serve in the Army. His older brother did, General Bartley. And so he grew up in his brother's shadow. Uh, but David, though, me and him are... I love that guy like a play cousin. I mean, I love that guy to death. But he said something that, the, or the first time I met him, we did a joint presentation up in Washington, D.C. And uh, he said something I'd never heard before. And he said, hope is a weapon. And and, and and the context that he said that was, and suicide's not the target. And uh, when he said that, I said, holy crap, man, I've never heard that before, but I'm still in it. <laughs> but right, I do. I mean, part of my defense, so I don't go back into that deep, dark place that I went to that I don't ever want to go again and I don't want anybody else to go to, is I remind myself and I use hope as a weapon. And I do. I tell myself all the time, one, hunt the good stuff. And and I tell myself, you know, life is good today. And every time that something good happens, I remind myself that my life just got better. I mean, just, I mean, just an example. I mean, me and my wife, uh, now that I'm retired out of the Army and now I'm back to work in the, the same organization I retired out of as a Sergeant Major. And uh, so now we're going to stay in Virginia. And so we're trying to find a place to uh, buy. And it just can't. And then I'll tell you, that's a, the most monotonous <laughs> process. I mean, a picture's worth a thousand lives when it comes to real estate. And uh, <laughs> But we finally found a house, I mean, and we find a place we liked and we took a bid in where they just accepted a bid before ours got through or we get out bid in. And so it just, it started getting frustrating, frustrating. I had to keep my, reminding myself to you know, just keep going, keep going. And so we found a house when we went out and looked at it, my wife, when we pulled in the driveway, she said, I love this house. This is where I want. So I said, All right, man, we do everything. So I got on the phone immediately, started setting everything up. So anyhow, we won the bid on the house. We closed on the 13th. So we're happy. But that's an example. I told myself, you know, life's good. I mean, we're finally going to have a house to call our own instead of paying somebody else's mortgage. We're finally going to get to settle down instead of moving every other year. Life is really good. Indeed. Tom, I have just so enjoyed 
the time we had together today and uh, oh, too. loved our conversation. I will echo the crowd of people who said it to you before. I think there's a really good book, not just a book. You know what? When you say, you know, people say, hey, you should write a book. You know, I think there's a good book there, Tom, a, a really good book. I think there's a great TED talk there as well. If you ever want to work your way on, onto that crazy, right. crazy <laughs> stage or whatever. I know that that was harrowing experience for me. Uh, I think the TED experience will maybe rival the first time you stood up and uh, did comedy. <laughs> All right. The first time maybe you jumped out of a plane or something. But I would love to stay in contact. And uh, yeah, for sure. I just so appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much yeah, for being on the show. Appreciate today. you as well. Thank you. Tom Campbell is is a remarkable man. He's done some things that that many of us will never do. Things that we will never experience. Things that we will never dream of experiencing or want to experience either. And, and he is on the other side of many of those experiences now and working not only on making his life as great as it can be, like we all are, but he's actively helping others to deal with their own challenges in the arena of mental health. His story is remarkable. I don't, I don't know that I've, I've sat recently and listened on a podcast to someone tell their story and, and felt as though I, I just couldn't interrupt even, even just to say yes, because it was a, a, a sort of sacred space as, as I was listening to him. But that's how I felt today as Tom was talking about survivor guilt and the work, his work in the military and his role as a leader and his view of leadership and speaking in particular about his own mental health and vulnerably sharing what he was going through at a period of time about 10 years ago in his life when he was thinking very seriously and planning, planning very seriously to take his life and was in the process of doing so when fate or good fortune or divine intervention or whatever you want to call it disrupted that plan. And uh, it's 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 a remarkable story. It's it's just uh, as as Tom said, a great plan is only is is only good to the point of its execution. A great plan is only good until the point of execution. And at the point of execution of his plan to take his life, it was disrupted. Fortunately, and so yeah, we talked about hope. We talked about hope as a weapon. We 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 talked about leaders as dealers in hope and how it is that is is so important uh, that we help people to feel that there is hope, that we acknowledge them, that we see them, that we help them to understand that their cognitive health, their brain health, their mental health is not something that we need to feel odd about or ashamed of, but rather instead that we to seek before there's a crisis. Too often we look at mental health as a reaction to a crisis. And by that point in time, it's harder than it needs to be. I know when I, I speak in, the, in this area of mental health in a resiliency context, um, often the lesson I share is that it's far easier to prevent our fatigue in the first place than to recover from it afterward. And, and in this same vein, it, it is easier to prevent our mental, our, our mental dis-ease if we are preventing it before beforehand. It, it's easier to prevent ourselves from from getting to that place where we're we're burned out even if we are if we are developing, working on, proactively creating our resilience before. Um, and that's in a context of work, that's in the context of leading and 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 leading others in in a work scenario and in a work environment and it's equally as important as you heard tom say in the military uh, in our family lives in our personal lives it was wonderful to hear him talk about how important it is that we take care of our mental health so that we have the capacity to also look out for others how how can we have other people's backs how can we be of service to others if we are putting ourselves and our health and well-being mentally emotionally physically and even spiritually in the back behind taking care of other people it's it's a riddle it and the answer as tom shared with us is to not do that is to put ourselves first and not see it as being selfish it's quite the opposite it's probably the most selfless thing that we can do is to be our best. 
so that we can be there for other people. Again, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed Tom's presence, his contributions today, and I absolutely hope that you will share this episode with other people that you may see as, as in need of it or people that you see either at work or at home who are, who are struggling in some way. Um, we would love for you to, of course, uh, rate this episode too, is if you feel like this was a valuable conversation and you could leave a five-star review on whatever the platform that you consume this podcast from, that would be helpful because it helps the algorithm to let more people know about it. More people will hear it, be given access to it. So that's helpful to us, of course, but it's also, and hopefully has a greater ripple effect in, in helping others. So thank you for doing that. You can also go to adamarkell.com forward slash podcast, adamarkell.com forward slash podcast to leave a comment uh, for Tom or myself, and we'll be the ones to answer that. If you want to check in with your own mental, emotional, physical, and even spiritual resiliency, it's as simple as going to rankmyresilience.com and just in three minutes time, uh, answering 16 very, very quick simple questions. You're going to get an immediate baseline score, uh, rankmyresilience.com. Uh, it's free. It's our, our contribution. And hopefully you will take advantage of it. Get a, a snapshot in time of how resilient you are, as well as what you can do to raise those numbers, raise your score by taking better care of yourself and the ways that the, the sort of granular details of what that can look like. So again, as always, thank you so much for your participation, for your being involved in the way that you are and for all that you do to support this conversation uh, and this community. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you're having a blessed and a beautiful day, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Ciao. Thanks for listening. We hope you now have even more tools and greater insights to build resilience and become change proof. Remember to leave a review on Apple podcasts and you may be featured in an upcoming episode. For more resilience tips and strategies, including support for building change-proof teams, visit adammarkell.com. To get your own free resilience assessment, go to rankmyresilience.com.